It's my pleasure to introduce to you our speaker for today, Juan Saucy, who's over there to the left behind the podium, where he ought to be. Um, Juan, for those of you in, in couplet or in Chinese studies, means uh, practically no introduction, so I will say very little about him, uh, because you already know all the things uh, about Han, uh, except that one thing you might not know about Han is that Han has been, um, for a long time, an incredibly uh, generous reader of and supporter of uh, the careers of a number of other young people, including me. Um, I'm not young anymore, but when I was young, uh, now that I'm middle-aged, he doesn't give a shit about me, but um, uh, that's not true. Uh, but in any case, uh, uh, Han met me when I was a graduate student and um, indulged me in, in uh, a long conversation uh, about my dissertation, about which I realized after the conversation he knew much more about than I did. Um, but he pretended that he didn't and was very sweet about it. And um, then uh, eventually the wife was at a school that had nothing to do with Hans University, uh, read the entire thing, and offered me um, support and advice. Um, He's done that for a number of other folks that I know of, both at the graduate student stage and, and early in their careers. Uh, he's just been continuously uh, an incredibly generous uh, and warm scholar, in addition to being the author of uh, four books, uh, including the prize-winning first book, uh, Problem of Chinese Aesthetic, uh, the prize-winning third book. I don't know what happened to the second book. With the second book, Great Walls of Discourse, prize-winning third book. You yeah, totally book. forgot the second yes, book. Yes, yes, exactly. But I didn't forget. I quoted a lot. Uh, uh, the Ethnography of Rhythm, which came out a couple years ago, which last uh, just won the MLA Scaglione Prize for Comparative Literature, and Translation of Citation, his book on Zhuangzi, which just came out uh, uh, from Oxford University Press. Um, he's uh, a wide-ranging, uh, multilingual scholar of, uh, of interesting things uh, and is here today to talk to us about bioinformatics. So, uh, Thank you. Oh, well, this, this is a, a very new talk. I just finished it this morning and I haven't even read it yet. So, so I, um, the me of 10 this morning apologizes for anything silly that the me of now is going to say. So here we go. Um, the duo of transliteration and translation, two complementary acts that I first came to appreciate in a high school biology textbook, has been with me for a long time and helped me think through various issues in my main areas of specialized interest, which are literary interpretation and Chinese philology. <coughs> the, the recent book that Eric was so good as to mention, uh, Translation and Citation, uh, plays a lot on the difference and relationships between transliteration and translation. So I'd like to explore some features of this duo today through an interrogation of the category of bioinformatics. That category promises something rather extraordinary, that our physical being, as living creatures constantly recreating ourselves through cell multiplication, resembles in some important way our behavior as social creatures exchanging verbal messages so that if you understood the one, you might stand a chance of understanding the other. That's apt to make the classical philologist feel a little bit more important than usual, and such feelings are not entirely to be discouraged. They're rare these days. But the trans transcription translation distinction is good to think with anyway. It doesn't become important only because it leaves outside of disciplines of language and culture. So, the difference between transcription and translation. It's easily stated. To transliterate is to substitute one set of letters for another. For example, you could translate a document in the Russian alphabet into the Sumerian or Korean or other systems. As long as you had a reliable, ta a reliable table of equivalences, you could do this without knowing anything about the content of the document or the sounds and meanings of the languages involved. To translate, on the other hand, is to take the content of a document in one language and present it anew in a different language. So one of them works on the level of the written signifier, as Saussurians would say, and the other one works on the level of words and signifies. A word is usually written with several letters, so the difference of kind is often accompanied by differences in scale, often but not always. The interesting questions, however, have to do with the interrelations of these two distinct things. Can you ever get from transliteration to translation? Does translation, or its possibility, constrain transliteration in some way? Are the conditions that call for translation or transliteration in the natural world at all paralleled by the conditions that call for them in the cultural world? What, to be playful about it, translates from language to biology and vice versa? 
Um, now, I have an example of transliteration and translation coming together that I stumbled upon the other day, reading something by Franz Boas about uh, doing linguistics and ethnography with American Indian languages. I'll just sort of narrate this to you as, as a side illustration. He says that it's, it's very dangerous to do any work on sort of higher cultural and religious matters with American Indian groups because the problem is that the people who possess some vocabulary in that department tend to be missionaries or else they're people completely uninterested in spiritual matters like traders or police or something. And so the people who normally mediate between an ethnographer and a community who are usually drawn from either the police or the missionaries, uh, they tend to distort the nature of the conversation, right? If you begin to talk about, you know, where does the world come from? Your Native American will say, okay, you know, I know what he's going to do. So, yeah, okay, you know, I'll, I'll give you the line about where the world comes from, right? The world was created by the great creator and then spouts off some biblical sounding stuff. And, and the conversation resolves itself satisfactorily, but without the ethnographer having learned anything probably about the actual beliefs and customs of the people he's talking about. So Boas didn't like having to go through these mediators, and he was pretty good at languages, not very good, and so he became a participant observer, hanging out with people, watching what they did, imitating their speech. And he discovered that he could actually, although he had a very small command of, let's say, Tlingit, he could begin to have conversations about important religious and spiritual matters, or about issues of aesthetics or ontology or whatever, uh, not by going through mediators, but by just listening to what people said when they began to talk about such things and writing the words that he didn't understand down. And then he would frame a question. He would say, well, well how is it that got it about it? And someone would give him an answer. Because if you used a word, it seemed reasonable that you understood what the word meant, although he actually didn't understand what it meant. And so by an iterative process that I'm calling transliteration, Right, of simply, simply imitating the outside form of a sign, he was able to elicit a kind of a dialogue that resulted in some content being put into that sign by his interlocutor. I, I find this very ingenious, uh, and I just couldn't resist talking to you about that as a concrete illustration of how transliteration and translation are not just for bibliographers. It actually touches on important issues uh, and maybe most important where translation is dubious, right? It's easy to translate between French and English. I mean, it's not really easy, but, you know, people have done it before, right? There are precedents, but translating between English and many other languages is, is much rockier because there's less precedent. And what precedent there is tends to be controversial, right? I'm thinking, of course, about my favorite hobby of trying to get things to go from English into Chinese and vice versa. So, that's sort of the realm in which I'm trying to think about translation and transliteration, but there's also an interdisciplinary issue, and the, the challenge will be to make these sets of issues communicate with one another somehow. Another occasion for thinking about translation, transcription, and bioinformatics <coughs> is given by the recent translation by our friends uh, Eric Caillot and Lea Bau of a 2006 book by the German philosopher Peter Janisch. Was ist Information, or what is information? Uh, I'm sure you know about this book, it's just come out. There could hardly be a more important to ask, you might think, in our day and age. Even if nobody understands information, and that's partly Janusz's contention, we are constantly buffeted around by the results of operations we call informational. Right? You know the sort of thing I mean. And as we go into a world of ever-increasing surveillance and data consolidation and so forth, information will be more and more our obsessive obsession. So if we were generally wrong about the character of information, as Janusz contends we are, that would be important news. The target of Janusz's critique is the naturalization of information. He identifies the myth of information as a natural object, as a clearly identifiable intellectual and social failure. Let's see, yeah. Okay, yeah, I have a couple of slides here. Well, all right. We do speak glibly about information at all sorts of junctures where our ancestors would have used different words. Information has colonized whole regions of the ordinary vocabulary, just as practices based on information technology have done in life. We give each other feedback and provide context. We close the loop and so on. American presidents, alas, are known to shoot missiles in order to send a message. 
Information in such expressions is naturalized. That is, its relevance is no longer questioned. The opposite of natural in Yarish's setting up of the problem would not be artificial or false, but questioned. And we need to learn to question the pertinence of this omnipresent language of information. Among the icons of the modern mythology that Janusz singles out are the idea that information is, as information, distinct from matter or energy. The genetic code, the <coughs> omnipresent communications technology, and the inflated expectations of neuroscience. The genetic code is a specially illustrative case. I'm uh, quite in, quoting uh, Janusz here. Ever since biological genetics and chemistry combined to create a new understanding of the molecular processes that take place in the cell nucleus when an ovum and sperm combine, it has become common practice to speak of these processes and their influential models in the language of communications technology. Today, words like coding, transcribing, translating, reading, speaking, and so on have become indispensable to the very representation of genetics. Their use is not a matter of the media finding figurative ways of explaining genetics to non-scientists, but rather a reflection of the original language of the experts and of textbooks in the field. I apologize for reading out that passage when I had it on the slide. I hate to do that. So there you are. All right, so that's, that's part of Janusz's case. Okay. And this is where he's ultimately going, that there's, there's something kind of large behind this. Right? It's not simply an error that one might make incidentally but it's part of a whole program of thinking about human beings and society and, and language. So I'm going to concentrate on uh, his, his uh, examination of genetic terminology as information technology, as a subset of information technology. I opened a medical textbook. Uh, let's see. Let me, I'll come back to some of these slides. These are uh, more Yanish materials. But let's, let's go directly to a medical textbook. Uh, the, here's a recent book that I just happen to have around. And you see how uh, Vishwanath Singappa and Christofari, authors of Physiological Medicine, uh, published 18 years ago, uh, start telling you how biological systems are particularly rich in information. And I'm the one, of course, who's put the emphasis on these passages. Uh, they actually give more examples of information lingo applied to biological phenomena than Janisch did. And they locate it in more parts of the biological realm. Janisch curious, curiously refers two or three times to fertilization of the ovum as the, as the instance of natural process that's misdescribed as an information exchange. And that's odd, since DNA and RNA are active in every living thing, from bacteria to plants to animals, and in nearly every vital process, including the growth of cells and proteins to maintain the existence of any creature. Lingaba and Fari don't restrict their discussion to DNA, by the way. They observe that the need to develop information technology isn't specific to humans, but is a consequence of general evolution and the appearance of animals consisting of more than one cell. Right? So here they're talking about the hormones and the, uh, the nervous system as another uh, set of vehicles for message transmission. So the example of the genetic code, while certainly renowned and important, is just one among many modes of communication among cells, organs, and pathways. With their focus on signaling, however, are these two medical authors part of the problem that Janish <coughs> is diagnosing? What is the problem, anyway? Janish contends that scientists and the general public are making a category error of a particularly momentous kind when they use the language of information and messaging to talk about things that are not conversations and relationships among human beings. Take, this is his example, a hotel where every guest has a room and a key. By some accident, one guest picks up, some, picks up another guest's key, tries to enter her own room, and finds it doesn't work. We might say that she has the wrong key. But that would be the right thing to say only in terms of human purposes, i.e. her desire to get into her own room. As far as the locks and keys are concerned, they are all right, and it's the human beings that are wrong. When we use words that properly uh, refer to human language and purposes to describe things that are not human, we make the inverse error, that of attributing too much agency, or the wrong kinds of agency, to the mere tools involved in an action that makes sense only among human beings. 
saying the key is wrong, or even more anthropomorphically, that the key should recognize the lock, is an error that, if I read Yannick right, both depersonalizes us and invests things with an uncanny degree of animism. There's kind of a trade-off there. His aim is to warn us off such superstitions, to return us to thinking of technology in terms of human purposes, not to recast human purposes in terms of technology. But along the way to this methodical repair work, Janich makes some rather extraordinary claims. His example of the lock and key, meant to remind us to locate error and correctness where they belong, is followed by a closely similar example about a pocket calculator, where Janich states that the ability of the machine to produce correct results amounts to a version of the famous mind-body problem. In what way do the mathematical descriptions of calculating processes depend on the technical and physical descriptions of the machine as such? The valid results the calculator produces do not follow logically from its technico-physical description. They also cannot be empirically or causally understood on its basis. That last couple of sentences were all from Yamish. I can't understand this passage if it means literally what it says. The people who designed the first electronic calculating machines had already learned mathematics, of course, especially set theory and logic and electrical engineering, too. They set up banks of relays and switches so that they would collectively model the steps in a mathematical computation. If they knew what they were doing, they produced an object whose technico-physical description did lay the ground for its valid results. Um, so it seems to me that there's a kind of a Husserlian idea of mathematical thinking that is insisting on its being different in kind from the operations of the designers who build such, uh, such thinking into networks of wires and vacuum tubes. At any rate, in genetics, the critique holds that a reductive anthropomorphism of information acts to raise genes, amino acids, and markers to the status of the sorts of things that send messages, code for this or that, recognize a corresponding base pair, and thus to lower humans to the status of mere operators of the communication technologies that do the real work of organizing society. Right? That's what uh, you know, he wants us to, uh, to learn not to fall in step with. The, the larger case that he's building is epistemological, using bioinformatics only as a leading example. He sees genetic code talk as a legacy of the mechanization of, in, of information, a false imaginary of the mechanical apparatus itself that has as, as its effects the reduction of humans to animals and of animals and humans to organisms that can eventually be modeled by machine theory in a bottom-up kind of way. Against these canons of modeling, Janich holds that no one has ever found a way to move from the description of material structures to the information they encode. Well, now I'm really puzzled as philologist rather than as a watcher of science documentaries. For in many cases, interpreters have had no choice but to start from the description of material structures and try to get from these to hints, uh, sorry, and try to get from these hints about the information they encode. Consider the case of someone trying to interpret an ancient script <coughs> like Sumerian or Akkadian or Linear B. If there are no intermediary texts or Rosetta Stone-like bilingual inscriptions, one can hardly rely on anything but the material structures of graphs and their recurrence to try to get to an interpretation. Or consider the case of a code breaker. Right? There, of course, the writer is very interested in your not being able to read the code. and You have to go in all kinds of indirect ways to find the uh, relation between the form and the meaning of the code. Or, if there are extraterrestrials out there sending signals, we, we would have to know how to recognize their intent to communicate, which is not to be taken for granted. We have to have some indices in common before we can begin to categorize our scanning of signals as a kind of communication. So perhaps that's an extreme case, but were we to intercept communications by aliens, we would have no choice but to begin with transliteration or the material side of the sign. Such problems show the scale of the operation that is aimed at, if not necessarily attained by such schematic slogans as bottom-up causation and emergence when we see them in uh, bioinformatics writings. And that's the thing that, uh, that Janich finds most controversial. He, he contends, as you saw, that, uh, that bottom-up explanation doesn't work, that, that there's really an inductive form 
that's, that's somehow necessary to understanding human communication and the things that, uh, that aren't interpretable in terms of intention and semantic units don't really count as communication. Right? That's where he's trying to draw the line between genuine human communication and things that look like communication but that we would be mistaken to take for communication. Well, um, I find that it might be helpful to make, sorry, to uh, make a little timeline of this code talk, right? How is it that we got to talking about biological processes in terms of code for uh, a dive through the Hathi Trust body of text, which being scholarly texts are a little bit more specialized than uh, just a general Google search, uh, will give you results like this one for code transliteration translation, right? This is a book published by the University of Chicago Press in 1904. It is the code of Hammurabi, king of Babylon, with transliteration, translation, glossary, index of subjects, index of proper names, map, and photograph of text, and so on, right? This is a, doing the whole philological package on that inscription by Hammurabi. And if you were reading books before 1953, and you stumbled on the words code, transliteration, translation, this is the kind of context where you would find it, right? In philological treatments. Um, and it's really from 1961 that occurrences of such phrases as genetic code and transcription uh, in the biological sense take off. So here, here is our, our timeline. That, uh, here's the starting timeline that I'll give you. Right? The first description of DNA by Crick and Watson in 1953 makes the dry observation that it is a possible copying me mechanism for the genetic material. Right? That's in this historic two-page article where they're explaining how the, the molecule is a double helix. They had a follow-up article a few months later, uh, also in the same journal, Nature, where they try to explain the function of the molecule. Right? The first one was to describe the structure of it, the second one is an attempt to guess the function. <coughs> and here they say uh, uh, that uh, the, is that, yeah, that's the May 30th. Yeah, they say that uh, this, uh, uh, hang on, sorry, I've got the, ah, uh, got the wrong place in the, yeah. Uh, sorry, let's look at the top quotation here first. Uh, the word copying is the one word with informational connotations in the six or seven hundred words in the first article about DNA. And it's not at all specific as to the mechanism. <coughs> the, the next article tries to explain uh, the function of the structure, and again, without, without informational connotations, right? It talks about duplication of the hydrogen bonds, there's a little bit of, an, of a sense of templates and copying, right? But this could be, this could be physicalistic, right? Three-dimensional or two-dimensional templates. The sort of thing that you might make with clay and a mold, let's say, right? or with printing technology. Um, hang on. So, uh, let me go back to that. Um, so analogies to things and events at human scale are necessarily used to figure forth events and actions at the molecular scale. How does it work? It works like this, right? That's the way that the scientific article is putting these analogies to processes of copying and duplication that are familiar to us in our daily lives. And template, as I mentioned, that's their leading word for talking about the function of the molecule. Uh, template could refer to all kinds of engineering solutions. There's also another article where they use the terms positive and negative, referring to the specific duplicating technology of photography and to its ancestor, woodblock carving and printing. Sequence, permutation, and code begin to creep into their descriptions, here occupying a recognizably linguistic or mathematical register, but code is not yet the master term that organizes all the others. There's an important change that happens in 1956, when Crick sketches out what he calls the central dogma of uh, molecular biology, that is the direction of transfer of information, right? It starts in DNA, it goes into RNA, and from RNA, it goes to making proteins. 
When he's writing this, it's all very much up in the air. Nobody knows exactly how it works. This is just his hunch given in a talk that he never published exactly in that form. Right? But it was an important and influential talk. And he says, information here means the sequence of the amino acid residues. Right? So we've got elements, the residues, and we've got a syntax, a sequence. Right? The structure, the function of DNA begins to look less like that of a photographic negative and more like the Scrabble set. But the scientific discussion was not yet conquered by the myth of the alphabet. Code and information metaphors were just one linguistic device, as of 1957, that could be used in exploring the still elusive behavior of molecules. Hans-Jörg Reinberger's history of this moment in the study of protein synthesis frames it as a conflict of metaphorical vehicles. Here, I've got a passage from Reinberger uh, talking about a 1958 essay by Zamechnik and colleagues where coding and template are, are being used, right? And as, uh, as Reinberger observes, coding is actually ambiguous in its use. Right? And uh, the, the important statement for me here, as I'm trying to reconstruct the history of this information talk in biology, is that, uh, as Reinberger puts it, the language of molecular information transfer began to inscribe itself into the metabolic representation of protein synthesis. And I looked up the article, the original article that uh, Reinberger is talking about here. It turns out that it's, as he says, where the language is not strictly chemical, its domain of analogical reference is entirely three-dimensional and physical. It's talking about linkage, attachment, incorporation, right? Things that molecules and things would do, right? There's, there's really no anthropomorphism until the last page when code makes an appearance but still in the company of the reassuringly physical term template. Reinberger is correct, I think, about the way analogies work in scientific language. They compete to inscribe themselves on the realities they purportedly describe, and they do so by replacing an earlier language. To read these analogies, we must learn to scratch away the layers of palimpsestic reinscription. But that means temporarily forgetting what we know at later stages of the history. <coughs> When there is still a lot of uncertainty about the validity of the descriptions, analogies compete for the best grip on the documented results. And, and where results are missing or ambiguous, the eventually victorious language neither did nor could replace its predecessor, as Renberger puts it at the end of the quotation here. A splendid example of hesitation between the template model and the letterpress model for protein synthesis occurs in a 19. 59 publication by Hoagland, right? another person who's working on the issues of different types of RNA and so on. Here, the amino acids are binding to fragments of letters and conveying them to their destined places in order to compose the word template. I think this is absolutely genius. You see how you have little bits at the top half of the letters that are being somehow ferried so that they will all line up nicely on the word template, which becomes the template for template. Right? A bit self-referential, but it's not a crime. So here, in this illustration, we have a compromise that undoes the whole notion of a letter-like code, for a fragment of a letter is not a letter anymore. It's an illegible mark. This does, however, serve to show the condition of the debate at that moment. Something is assembling material structures into something that conveys a uh, a meaningful sequence, but it isn't clear what directs the assemblage or what the items conveyed are. So that puzzlement is rather nicely depicted in this picture. François Jacob, Jacques Monod, and Arthur Pardy, the team known under the wonderful abbreviation PAJAMO, used the term cytoplasmic messenger in 1959. Whoops. Let's go back to our chronology here. Right? They used the term cytoplasmic messenger as early as 1959, but how exactly the process worked and above all what the messenger was made of, they could not yet say. The decisive year for the term <coughs> genetic code, and this you can see in word frequency uh, results, is 1961, <coughs> when the series of events that must occur for the nucleotide sequences to be inscribed in a protein form became clear through the conjoint operation of several labs. Uh, there was a famous accidental 1961 meeting among the Cambridge groups gathered around Crick and the Institut Pasteur group gathered around Monod and Jacob. 
Uh, this, this accidental meeting resulted in the elaboration of a new conceit, messenger RNA, that Crick imagined as a reading head, like in a tape recorder. Messenger RNA, he says, was like a tape that copied information from DNA and then carried that information to the ribosome, which read it off and followed the instructions to make the appropriate protein. And this is Crick writing some years after the event, but his, uh, his memory of the event, the event is perhaps colored by the subsequent success of informational language. Now, messenger RNA and its equipment of code, letters, messages, messages, and instructions was beginning to overwrite all the previous analogies. The code no, needed no longer to be duplicated, but rather to be regulated by operator molecules. Right? And the, the terms like messenger and operator are significant because they indicate that the model is no longer the analog model of the template, but it's an informational model. The form of the message was not the key point. What was important was the function, and the messenger is not part of the protein that results. Right? It stands apart from the protein and directs its formation. Uh, as Monod and uh, Jacob put it, regulatory genes do not have a defined structural or metabolic function. They exist to control the expression of metabolic or biosynthetic functions. All right, so, and from this moment, uh, the, the informational language takes off and becomes obligatory if you're going to be working in genetics. It's obviously successful because it helps to direct research. It helps to summarize the results of research, right, where if you needed to give a molecular characterization of what's happening, it would be perhaps long and drawn out and terribly detailed. Uh, you can achieve a certain informational economy by using this terminology. And, um, and also, it's, uh, it seems to be associated with the winning team. Right? Crick, in 1958, at the time of that uh, little doodle that I showed you earlier, that is before the Jacob and Monod results collide with his results, uh, Crick had claimed that information talk was just a way of making molecular biology accessible to non-specialists. But from 1961 onward, it becomes the dominant language among the specialists. As Janich observes mournfully, in the context of molecular biology, there are no linguistic alternatives. The metaphors are, for all intents and purposes, the primary ground of meaning. And I think of François Jacob's book, La Logique du Vivant, from 1970, as the triumph song of this informational biology, predicting its extension to the social and cultural levels in ways that Janisch, I think, would be uh, shaking his head about, too. So this, anyway, is how we came to have a biology that's saturated with terms taken from language, philology, communication. It's anthropomorphic. It's metaphorical. It can certainly mislead, like any vocabulary, rich in connotations. And this is language uh, of information that was not in biology from the start. It has a history and origin point and a rise in prominence through conflicts in argument that we can observe through the, the written record. Had the template been a better vehicle for summarizing lab results, code and message talk would have faded away. And it's still possible that investigation into other aspects of the genetic process, for example, the folding of proteins, will demand a different vocabulary and make genetic message talk obsolete. Authoritative languages in science what some would call paradigms, come and go, wax and wane, and are discarded with admirable ruthlessness by the researchers who find a new model to push. Now, in describing genetic information and kindred expressions as a massive uh, delusional category error, I think Yanish is missing the precise nature of speech acts in science. Possibly he's been taken in by the status and authority of science in our present world. If it were true that a scientific statement is offered apodictically, and that some such statements are erroneous, then the right way to correct them would be to expunge them. But a scientific statement, and most obviously a metaphorical scientific statement, is a speech act of a specific kind, the wager. I say something as a scientist, not because I know it is true, but because I bet it is true, and I defy you to prove me wrong. So when scientists or popularizers writing on behalf of scientists make claims that seem exorbitant, they are simply doing their job offering risky wagers that can be confirmed or rebutted with differentiated rewards going to the people who take part in the process. It would be absurd for Janisch to give, on the one hand, the very sensible advice that we should remember that communication happens among human beings for human purposes, 
and then deny that the scientific communication in which biophysical events are described as if they were messages and signals is anything but a human communication made for human purposes. Bunyanich says, again, with perfect accuracy and relevance, that human communication is a tool as a means of organizing cooperation. We can see him as confirming Lingapa and Fari's point about the evolution of multicellular organisms. They need to cooperate if they are to form organs and hire animals, so signaling must occur. So too, scientists must cooperate if they are to form labs in which to investigate the operations of DNA. And one of the ways they cooperate is by unleashing exorbitant metaphors onto the discursive space where they may growl and pounce on one another. There is no reason to kill the messenger RNA. It's just the bearer of the envelope and not responsible for what's inside. There's, there's more, but I think this is enough for today. Uh, the, uh, the other part of the talk would be to take you through a separate timeline, but I'm afraid this really would mean another hour, uh, in which to the previous timeline, shown here in black, right, which is sort of the straight progression from Crick and Watson's analysis of the molecule down to this informational paradigm. But before that happened, there had been Shannon's work on the mathematical theory of information, for which Yannick has many unkind words. And you know, his, his critique, by the way, is completely on point. There are a lot of crazy and naive things in Shannon. Uh, and John von Neumann's lecture on making a self-reproducing automaton. The important thing about that is that in the 1948 lecture, which was not really published in wide, uh, widely distributed form until 1966, uh, von Neumann had described a machine that uh, consisted of code, and in which code took two forms, assembly instructions and data. And the machine would copy the instructions for making itself onto another body, then it would copy the description of itself into that same body. So one, one part of that data becomes code, let's say, and uh, instructional code, and the other part of it becomes content, that is, transliteration and transcription. He was doing this uh, basically out of uh, logical uh, interest uh, and essentially discovering the necessary conditions for messenger RNA and those other transliterating phenomena uh, long before any genetics talk came in. And von Oman says in one paragraph, oh yeah, this is probably the way the genetic code works, but you know, that's for geneticists to deal with. Right? But his interest is in elaborating an informational uh, body of, of lore. So the reason for bringing that, uh, that other leap back into the past uh, is uh, to see what happens when we think of information theory not as something that's sort of plugged into biology or pasted on top of uh, a biology that ought to make enough sense in purely biological terms, but in some way as predicting the biology that would then be done by biologists who didn't know anything about the information theory to start out with. So, but that's, as you see, a, a different, somewhat complicated story. So, thank you for your patience. Questions? Uh, yeah, thank you very much uh, for your talk. Uh, very, very interesting. Um, one thing that you, that was kind of, this is half a comment, half an unformed question. Um, the, the importance of metaphors uh, really struck me, and I was thinking of Lakoffian metaphor theory, which I can be very critical of, having studied cognitive linguistics. Uh, but the idea that, you know, metaphors are always kind of structuring um, the way that we talk about things that aren't us. Um, and especially technological metaphors for representing the mind. I was thinking of the famous Leibniz quote about, like, imagine the mind be a machine and it has gears and levers and pulleys, and now the mind is a computer and so forth, and who knows what comes next. So I was just thinking of how that kind of brings in another timeline, perhaps, to think about of the ways that I wonder to what extent we've always been using um, whatever the most advanced technology is to talk about other things that we're also studying that we don't quite understand yet, like information. So I thought there was kind of another timeline that might uh, influence. And then, yeah, and I guess the, the comment was just about, or the, the question was about the kind of 
uh, trickiness with, you know, and, and it's almost more of a, a slightly a criticism of the very little I know about Yanni from your talk about, you know, you, how do you talk about something directly, really, uh, that's, that's not a human system? Like, we're always going to be imposing uh, a belief. Uh, and so rather than, you know, criticize this imposition, which is, I haven't read the book from Yannick, but what it seems like he's doing, to me, I, I wonder if there's a way to just be more attentive to that. I think maybe that's what you're also, what your talk is about, is being attentive to that, uh, that, that mediating through, through metaphor, as opposed to just writing it off as a mistake. Yeah, yeah. No, I, was, I, I had a great experience reading the Yannick book. I'm very grateful to uh, Eric and Leah for translating it. But there were moments when I just lost patience. What does he expect? How does he think we're going to talk about everything that's not human in you know, terms that are other than human? And here, I think my guy would be Vico, right? The great Giambattista Vico back in 1742, who says, it is not through knowing things that man uh, creates. It's through not knowing things, right? And his example, his first example is children who pick up inanimate objects and make them speak because that's how you create a playmate for yourself out of matter. He says actually everybody is doing that. That's what Homer did, right? So in a way, you know, people I think in the 18th century thought that this was debasing all the great triumphs of culture by making them into this kind of anthropomorphic fantasy. But um, uh, I think I think Vico was right. right? We don't have any choice but to metaphorize and anthropomorphize. And, and so I guess I'm trying to undercut the critique of metaphor and anthropomorphosis uh, where it is by feeding back into it Janusz's demand that we understand these all as human acts among human beings. And that I'm totally happy with. So let's just remember that behind the genes yeah. in the great genetic theater are scientists agitating for what they think is, is going to be true or get them a grant. <laughs> I lost you at the Maybe, maybe you can help me figure out where information sort of changed its meaning, uh, right? Uh, because uh, I'm not sure whether it was the Crick and Watson slide, but uh, uh, we read, information here means the sequence of amino acid residues. Mm -hmm. uh, that sounds like information as uh, a structure, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but but it seems to me very soon afterwards, you're really talking about information as if it can be transposed to to content or to data, mm -hmm. right? So are are they messengers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, yeah. so you know, when does when does that little shift occur? Right. That, you know, that that's just what happens between the late '50s and 1960, 61, right? Because the researchers. Uh, mainly at the Institut Pasteur, they begin to identify different forms of RNA. Uh, maybe I should back up a little bit. So you've got DNA within a cell, but to get the DNA out of it, you have to uncoil it and synthesize different types of RNA that are able to exit the cell and recombine in other cellular material. Right? So RNA can do things that DNA can't do. Right? DNA is great for storage, bad for transmission. RNA does the transmitting. And People uh, found transfer <coughs> RNA, messenger RNA, and so on. That's, that's the active, the really active part of genetic research in 6061. So from that moment, you had this kind of ballooning, right, this hypertrophy of the category of information, which at this point in, in Crick's 1956-57 notes about the central dogma is pretty simple and still can be translated back into physical terms. Right? But Messenger RNA is, is a thing that performs an operation that results in a new cell. Right? Is it's, it reversible? It's, uh, no, you can't get from right, so the protein. Those, those, those yeah. conditions hold as well. That's right. This, this basically holds true, although the, the middle stages here were still very unclear, and it's, it's the contribution of the 6061 uh, research to, to clarify that. But, uh, but so, anyway, and that's, that's the moment when it seems that you can do no wrong by talking about information in a greatly expanded sense, right? Not just the sequence of the, of the amino acids that you find in the DNA. Erica. Hi, thank you so much for a really thought-provoking um, talk. And I, I was just at, at a, a symposium where we were talking about the human and the non-human and the automaton and, 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 you know, the limits of human uh, 
intentionality or, or unconscious, you know, acts on the other hand. And I was wondering about actually, so I have so many questions, uh, but to start out with your use of the term code, throughout you wanted to maintain a kind of sense that code was about uh, it, would, it, it came in a package of transliteration and translation. It was kind of like a kind of more literary um, uh, background. Um, and I thought, and then you put the code of Hammurabi up there. And that immediately, because in, in, in the context of, say, early China or anything, code would have been like a translation for a kind of legalistic type of, of, of um, approach. <laughs> um, it, you know, where you're actually writing down laws and, and, and not, you know, less so the translation mm -hmm. um, um, packaging. Mm -hmm. And so, but then you move to the more kind of like computer language mm -hmm. of the 50s and 60s, showing when it really starts to come in. And I was wondering, I mean, where, where does it, is it, is code, when they start using it in the bio sphere, uh, is it, is it that they're adopting it from kind of computer language already? You know, in the, in the sense that he, uh, this man was saying that we're, we're adopting our technologies and then kind of using those metaphors. Mm -hmm. Or is it the other way around, that somehow code is coming from the literary, maybe also the legalistic sides, you know, and that it's being, you know, kind of used in this, in this new setting of, of bioinformatics. And mm -hmm. then, and it's a, it's a very convenient way to talk about computers. Right. I, I don't know, I was just yeah. wondering what you, yeah. what you well, um, you know, I see in the late 50s that the code and the template are still existing together, right? And so, you know, a code, I mean like a, you know, secret code, right, a cryptographic code is something that has a visible side and an invisible side, right? You know, there's the part that you're trying to crack and the part that you'll get through, through to if you're able to crack it, right? But that seems not to be the same sort of thing as a template, which is a, a physical object that's manifest as it is. And so in the in the late 50s, people are still using these interchangeably just to mean some kind of a pattern or a system or something. And uh, But it's after 6061 that code specifies and becomes much more letter-based, right? And less uh, kind of pattern or object-based. Mm -hmm. Now, part of, part of the reason for saving till the end the uh, this longer chronology is that a lot of the connections here are a bit obscure, or maybe they're just obscure to me and I haven't read the right books yet, it's very possible, uh, but the, uh, the people who were involved in the Shannon and von Neumann research also were sometimes participating in or uh, next door lab partners with people who are doing genetics research, particularly at the University of Illinois, by the way. So here's a shout out to Illinois. So Arthur Burks, who transcribed uh, the the talk about self about uh, self-generating automata, was also working in the biological labs where Zemechnik and Stevenson and Hecht were doing that uh, that work that that I saw as as kind of waffling between code and template. Right? Mm -hmm. So there's there's something definitely going on there in which. Code is, is a promising word, right, that seems to offer more than it has on its surface. And um, another, another reason for being vague about this is that a lot of the work was still classified because it was war research. Right? So is it moving from analog to digital? Is this this kind mm -hmm. of like transition that we're, yeah. you know, because you have the patterning right. of a template. I mean, it's right. an actual, you know, like you mentioned woodblock printing. So right. it's a kind of imprint, yeah. you know, going from printing technology almost to the computer. That's printing. right, yeah. The word, so. the word template to me connotes an analog form of replication. Mm -hmm. right. And the word code suggests the digital, but there's that moment when code is still undecided. It hasn't really figured out which way it's going to go, it seems. And it's, it's you know, basically, it's the messenger RNA that, that precipitates the move towards the digital. It's so interesting. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, um, much of the, the uh, metaphorics that you're using is, of, is of course, uh, linguistically bounded rather than, than universal, mm -hmm. or maybe not. Uh, can you explain uh, your Epitaph on the very first slide, Tianhe Tianhe Yan Zai. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I was hoping somebody would catch up on that. Yeah. All right. This is this is a, a little joke for those of you who read Chinese, right? Uh, in the Analects, Confucius says, right, Tianhe Yan Zai, right? When did nature address people? I'm giving kind of a you know a, 
uh, a pulled out of shape kind of translation, right? People, mm -hmm. I think Legge would translate this as, does heaven speak, right? Uh, but I'm sort of uh, giving it a slightly different paraphrase. When, when did nature address people? Uh, the four seasons uh, go about their rounds, the, the hundred things are born, and when has nature ever addressed people? Right? So this is a very strange statement in Confucius' Analects. Uh, I assume that somebody must have said, nature is addressing people, right? Or there is language already in nature, and we have only to listen to it to find out what's right. right? Maybe, you know, maybe somebody was exploiting the dual meaning of the word Dao, which can mean to speak, or it can mean a path, right? And we don't have the context, we have to sort of create the context out of our imaginations, but I assume that Confucius is rejecting the idea that there is language in nature. And so in that way, he's kind of a good fellow traveler for Yanni, who also thinks that we do wrong to inscribe language on nature. And that causes us to, to locate meaning in the wrong places, right? Looking for meaning in all the wrong places, <laughs> right? So, anyway, so that's, that's how Confucius comes in. But I actually don't have a terribly mythological uh, connection for these uh, isolated remarks. Just thought I'd put it in to, to stimulate a question that was better than the answer. <laughs> yes? Yes, I have a question that goes back to your comment about Kingit. Mm -hmm. So, the difficulty goes like this. From a Kingit perspective, one wouldn't necessarily be able to make this argument because um, the the refusal to construct the world between signifier and signified in Kingit would mean that that the only way to operationalize an understanding of language would be through metonymy, not metaphor. Mm -hmm. So I'm a little concerned that. I'm asking you to reflect about how um, specific to Western culture, which is a huge grab bag, and I understand that, for lack of a better term, this particular argument around science would be. Because as somebody who's negotiated between medical science and post-colonial language on a regular basis, this is kind of the core of the issue mm -hmm. in the sense, if you understand what I'm saying. Right. So that it's not what you're saying wouldn't hold in certain kinds of contexts. And that has huge medical issues related to it because there's no sense in, in some cultures that work through the human as in metonymic relationship to these, uh, the world, other parts of the world, mm -hmm. rather than as the center or as metaphor, mm -hmm. there's, there would not be a sense of illness in the same way because the failure to, uh, for example, the, the occasional failure uh, of the RNA to break the cell and go to the right places would not necessarily be seen as a, as a failure in the logic of informatics. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? I think so. Yeah. It's good to see you again, by the way. I hope yes. you have a good winter. I yeah. did. Thank all right, you very much. all right. It's great to see you in the, in January at MLA. I'm yeah. sorry I forgot your name, though. Please. Rose Jolly. Rose, that's right. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, um, the, the, the thing that I love about the Boas passage is that he's, he's basically putting over a deception on the people he's interviewing, right? He's oh, yes. pretending to understand the words that they are using and really just sort of fishing for them to use the words enough times that he can make form a guess about what they mean. But he also says, and again, this is not authoritative, but it's simply what Boaz has ascertained about the ontology of the people he's talking with. He's ascertained that uh, as far as they're concerned, no one can use a word without being in possession of the meaning. Right, so there, the signifier and signified would be in a metonymic relation. Right, yes, absolutely. If, if I speak the word Dao, then I know what Dao means. Right, I'm you know using the Chinese word because I don't know any uh, Qingit. You're out of Qingit at the moment. Yeah, that's right. But uh, so he would be basically pretending to be a competent speaker for long enough that he can collect enough evidence to become a competent speaker. Right, so in a way, he is. Uh, becoming a sort of a metaphor of the competent speaker, right? With a, an outside that's not the same as an inside, but hoping eventually to become metonymized into that community of speakers. So it's a very, very uh, devious and, and, uh, and clever text. Right? But 
why, why does he assume that uh, they are being honest with him? Oh, well, he, he doesn't always assume <laughs> that, right? In this, yeah. uh, it, this, this is a short little text in the, in the bulletin of the Institute of America, American Ethnography for, I think, 1898, where he's just given pages to all the deceptions that come from, from the speakers, from these interlocutors, from bad dictionaries, and so on. Yeah, right. And so he says, okay, here's the best I can do. Here's my method, right? Basically, play the fool and keep on repeating things you don't understand until you can at least imitate the language of people. But there's a trickster on the other side. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. So on the, on the other side, it's, it's mysterious, but also I think about how we become members of communities that, say, practice uh, post-structuralism or philosophy or whatever. Right? There's a day when you go into the room and you don't know what people mean by, let's say, you know, mediated negation or synthesis. And you kind of hang around and you watch people say synthesis enough times. You say, oh, okay, I think I can use that in a sentence now. Uh, let's say, you know, was, uh, was the Roman Empire the synthesis of the Persian and the Greek models? Uh, and Professor Hegel says, good, you have passed the history exam. Yeah. Right? And, but maybe you didn't actually know that, but you were just experimenting with the terms, right? You could still be living in transliteration, as it were. Right? So I think, in a way, that's how we, how we learn. So I think boys. Oh, it's how we produce colonial knowledge. I mean, there's well, two different ways of looking at that. Yeah, but not only colonial knowledge, I would say, right? I mean, you know, there's there's a trickster element to boss, but maybe there's a trickster element to to a lot of us, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So I mean, the when I think of transliteration, the first instance that I think about is, of course. Uh, Xuanzang's uh, mm -hmm. translation of the Sanskrit mm -hmm. uh, Buddhist, uh, Buddhist scriptures in Sanskrit, right? He made mm -hmm. a really great decision of not translating mm -hmm. certain Sanskrit words mm -hmm. into Chinese, but retaining the sound of it, right? And it's very much for ritualistic effect. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering how we think about this 1950s sort of episode of production of scientific knowledge in relation to this kind of very religious mode of production of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well there were, uh, you know, Xuanzang of course was coming after 400 years of practice in, in translating Buddhistic texts and the, the practice went through many different phases. So, um, you know, at the, in the early texts uh, you have uh, Buddhist uh, sutras that read like very clumsily written Chinese discourses. Right. And gradually there begins to be more of an appreciation and even a, an appetite for foreignness. Right? People have develop a tolerance for it. And I'm sure ritual forms went along with it. Also you have a highly organized sangha where you have people in monasteries who are translating but also checking their translations against other works that have been translated before. Right? Mm -hmm. so, all of that had to had to happen in a kind of special environment from which you could then go out and influence society. As long as there wasn't such a, a big Buddhist uh, community that it could have its sort of its own center of gravity, it was dependent on external language and had to present itself as external language. So the transliteration idea, I think, just depends on there being that kind of consciousness. And I have a uh, kind of an experimental confirmation of that in the 17th century. When the, when the Jesuits came to China, there was, of course, a controversy about whether Western metaphysics could be presented in Chinese, right? It was all kind of familiar to us. And one guy, Longobardi, who sort of unveiled this whole problem, uh, decided that the only way to present uh, you know, Latin, Italian, Western, Christian concepts in Chinese was through transliteration. So people would, you know, would go to the mass and they would hear transliterated Latin syllables. And he published a little book, a little mass book, and it's a very disorienting thing to read because, to my ear in Chinese, you know, when they, when they, uh, you know, it says, you know, the priest goes to the altar and says, "Ina tuoli wo adu aldera," and when I read this, it feels totally Buddhist, right? And I'm sure. Uh, you know, I, I surmise that a Ming Dynasty person passing by the door and overhearing this kind of language from the inside would say, oh, okay, it's those Buddhists again, right? And that project actually failed because there wasn't enough of a community that had an appetite for that kind of foreignness. Right? So this book is kind of the one of its kind. 
So there, there's where transliteration fails to take a root because there's not a community for whom even nonsense syllables can be meaningful if they're provided the right context and the right situation. Thank you very much for a very provocative talk. I'm sure I'll come up with more intelligent questions in a couple of weeks' time. But, um, I wonder, the examples that you've given, one of which was the Boris example, another of a child learning language, and then your informatics, bioinformatics example, to what extent is the bioinformatics instance exemplar? Because it seems to me that the questions, for instance, including a uh, uh, question about um, transliteration in, in, the, um, in this particular religious instance. These are of a different kind. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I have the intuition from hearing the questions that transliteration and translation, when the language has a spiritual intent, mm -hmm. might be of a, of a, a different kind. And therefore, whether or not your bioinformatics instance is drawing on a theory of transliteration and translation in the same way mm -hmm. as these other texts mm -hmm. are, I think I have an intuition that this might be of a different kind. Mm -hmm. uh, partly because of the issue of tricksterism or um, what you just called nonsense syllable having a substantive meaning. I mean, it seems to me there that there are levels of meaning of the transliteration which may not map easily on the, the, the way you, you are uh, uh, drawing a history of, of the shift in um, the use of, of, of informational uh, metaphors to talk about biology. And one example I, I have from a Malaysian case is the recent um, passing of a law forbidding Christians from using the word Allah God, mm -hmm. where the word Allah means God mm -hmm. in Arabic. Mm -hmm. So it is then to claim that there's a meaning, there's a, shall we say, a transliterated meaning in the word that it is of such concrete force that it is not available, though its translated meaning mm -hmm. should be and is available mm -hmm. to, to be all of other faith traditions beyond the sun. Yeah. It just feels to me as though the the category of the religious may add something to the shift from transliteration to translation, which might it, it might be helpful for you in your, your theory, because right. bioinformatics may be distinct from the other instances you get. Right, right. It would be a very interesting test question uh, to learn about religious representations if you asked, if you went out in the street and asked people if God is the same as Allah, for example, mm -hmm. right? Those who say yes would, you know, probably be of a more, let's say, cosmopolitan, syncretic, ecumenical frame of mind, and those who think they're different personages would, you know, maybe be of a more exclusionary frame of mind. But I'll tell you something. I was, you know, I, I grew up uh, an Episcopalian, so I'm familiar with the old prayer book and so on. Uh, but one time in Paris, I went to a Maronite wedding where the mass was conducted in Arabic, and I remember hearing the priest intone the syllables. Uh, Ishwa bin Allah, and being shocked, you know, I mean, I, I'm not a speaker of Arabic, and I, I, you know, I'm not a Muslim, but that seemed to me just an exorbitant, crazy, strange thing to say, and, you know, although, of course, I was prepared for it by my upbringing, but just encountering that, that you know, that particular collocation of words hit me before I was intellectually ready to say, oh, yes, of course, that's the equivalent of Son of God, which we hear, you know, 900 times a day, uh, so, uh, this is exactly the kind of thing, right? The interesting thing is how, what happens when language gets into somebody's ear and begins affecting them, right? Which transliteration does in a different way than translation, I'd say. Right? That's what I'd offer as kind of a general observation. And yes, I think it's a good task to look into what kinds of different things it does in, in different situations. And I would say that of the two, transliteration is by far the more neglected one, right? Because it seems to be self-evident when you simply, you know, copy letters off the table and, you know, maybe just do it for convenience. There's no meaning attached to this, whereas translation, right? They have a, a very deep and exalted and complex discourse about translation. Nobody will come to a conference about transliteration, except maybe a bibliographer or two, <laughs> which kind of proves my point. So I think we need to, to 
put some spotlights on the transliteration as, as a cultural practice that is by no means meaningless, although we behave as though it would have been this other to be. All right, folks, we're actually, we have to stop because of the time. Uh, but you're welcome to talk to Juan afterwards, but he'll be around. Uh, so please join me in thanking him one more time.